Great. Anyway, long story short, you know, this is uh, over the past 10 plus years, there has been a lot of effort, including people in Prado and also Lano and also a lot of the Eastern uh, <laughs> universities. You know, this is really a very nice development. And I would also like to thank my collaborators, uh, Shao Chan Li and a few young people, especially Omar, and also in Queen Dimitri, we had a nice paper last year. And we have a Lano group uh, really doing um, both relativistic and non-relativistic reflection. Um, so just a... Uh, I guess I will just cancel this one. Just as a general introduction about many reconnection. It is, you know, this, you know, very nice move. We sort of show you the simplest uh, um, process where the anti-parallel many field lines can approach each other, um, break and rejoin the field lines. And by this process, you can have a lot of the magnetic tension energy release. Um, you know, and by bricks, but you, if you think about it, it's actually a very challenging, proven to be a very challenging problem to model theoretically and uh, computationally, because you need to understand uh, the where this uh, uh, diffusion region, where how the many field lines break, and also over large domain where the energy release is happening. So it's a very classical multi-scale process. And until now, it's still very, very challenging, especially for large scale systems. And here are a few <laughs> examples for reconnection. And basically, of course, wherever you can find a plasma, you probably can have some kind of reconnection. But this is sort of also you with a different community. They sort of deal with different scales if you can normalize the system scale to a kinetic um, scale, plasma kinetic scale. Here I'm using DI, the ion inertial lens. In laboratory, um, they deal with a fairly small system usually. Um, sometimes you have a couple of DI, but you know it, some of the um, experiments can be as large as 10 DI. So there we actually can use fairly robust uh, fully kinetic simulations um, to handle the whole thing, <laughs> so a whole experiment. But it's getting more challenging if you, you know, try to do a mental sphere global simulation. I know here in um, Colorado, there are people doing this kind of science, um, especially for three-dimensional simulations, it's still a challenge to start you know, use a global kinetic simulation to model the whole magnetosphere. But if you go try to go to larger systems, this is a solar flare simulation, uh, solar flare picture, and their scale can be, you know, something like uh, 100 million times of the kinetic scale, or even some, you know, even more extreme large scale astrophysical, you know, Host of winds, black holes, uh, um, you know, astrophysical jets, those regions are much, much, much larger than the kinetic scale. So traditionally, those regions you have to use fluid codes to model, but then you lose some information, for example, the non thermal emissions. Um, okay, for example, in the mango tail, people have. You know, in situ observation, you can, like, for example, NASA's uh, MMS observation, they can go to the mangle tail. That's usually where the strongest reconnection in terms of the energy release per particle. There, the alpha speed can reach even like 5,000 5, kilometers per second. And they, all, they actually say uh, energetic particles are being accelerated that this lower left figure is showing that in the tail reconnection region, the thermal particles can reach 
uh, KEV or uh, 10 inch KEV, non thermal can reach up to 100 KEV. And those particles can actually further accelerate in the collapsing regions and even the radiation belt and reaching something like uh, <laughs> uh, a, 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 mega, a million uh, electron volts. And uh, the in situ observation on the right, this example actually shows a MMS observation. They can measure the energy distribution function. They actually find clearly this non thermal spectrum. And if you look at how much uh, fraction of a of particles are actually in the non thermal range, is typically larger than 10%. So it's very, you know, high efficient non thermal acceleration. And uh, this is the example for many reconnection and particle acceleration in solar flares. So on the left, this is showing a, um, um, I believe, ultraviolet um, observation that's showing there the flare on the limb of the sun and produce, uh, you know, there's the cavity of a uh, heart of the coronamass ejection, but below, they actually see those uh, um, emissions from the flare region. Uh, and those few lines are actually from MHD simulation try to represent this, uh, this uh, particular flare event. And we see that below this uh, coronamass ejection, there is a current sheet that actually um, concentrated with uh, microwave emissions generated by re relativistic electrons, um, roughly something like uh, above 100 keV uh, up to MeV. And if you look at their emission distribution, this example is a hot X-ray. They typically follow in, you know, this non-thermal spectrum and the best explanation we have is that the particles are accelerated into a um, power law energy distribution. Um, of course, you know, some of us are very interested in uh, applying many reconnection in astrophysical objects. Um, there are recent um, nice observations from the um, uh, event horizon uh, collaboration showing the uh, emission from uh, surrounding the black hole. And those are also relativistic electrons and prone to be non thermal, but they probably still need to be modeled more uh, nicely. And also, this background actually shows the, you know, on the upper left, showing the uh, this um, figure from uh, Bart Roberta. Uh, the, a global simula MHD simulation of the accretion disk. You, you sometimes see the, the uh, formation of the current sheet, even uh, some of the regions, you can see the fast moles are generated uh, in those regions that indicates maybe a strong um, analyzation process is happening. And uh, the lower left is the uh, example of the jet simulation where you could generate a kink instability and maybe generate a um, secondary reconnection that maybe make the jet shining by the, the related plasma process. Of course, there also could be a strapped jet scenario. And on the right, uh, um, the upper figure is this uh, figure Dimitri uh, had in his uh, 2014 paper showing the, you know, close to the POSA uh, magnetosphere, the current sheet can um, produce reconnection and especially the plasmoid chain. That's actually some of the uh, mechanism we are actively looking at to explain the non-thermal emission. And the, on the bottom, this is the uh, classical strapped vein the, uh, because of the, the rotation of the neutron star, this uh, uh, current sheet can extend uh, um, by the by the pulsar wind, and uh, because of this angle between the magnetic dipole and the, the rotation, uh, neutron star rotation, it generates this uh, um, this wavy current sheets, and that, those regions can also subject reconnection. 
and we see those in those uh, um, post, uh, fast rotating pulsars. They, they are naturally always support uh, very high energy emission. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, recent observations show emission up to PEV gamma rays. So th those are the regions that we think material reconnection is happening and also strong particle acceleration happening. So it's really, you know, different uh, community are uh, uh, actively looking at reconnection and associated uh, particle acceleration. This slide sort of summarizes uh, a little bit about the recent progress. Um, last year, they have a uh, nature physics paper talking about in a, a medical reconnection layer um, produced by this coil uh, 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 reconnection. There is an excellent develop and that it seems like that excellent produced producing energetic particles um, mm -hmm. with their diagnostic. And also in this middle panel, this is another MMS event at magneto tail. And they actually showing a very turbulent um, fluctuating reconnection layer and that generates uh, uh, clear ion acceleration. And on the right, it's the same, same event as I showed in 2017. Um, about the, the the emission from the reconnection layer. And there also could be some kind of three-dimensional structures related to that. And the, the bottom right is showing the uh, uh, more clear, a little bit of spatially resolved uh, um, image from the high uh, altitude the water channel curve observation. The two nearby post-army nebulae, they all both of them emit larger than 50 mm -hmm. PEV emissions. So this is actually several different communities have a very <coughs> vibrating um, research on the you know reconnection and particle acceleration. We two years ago we had a, a mini conference in the DPP uh, conference, and uh, I think it's some of uh, some of us were in that conference, so we had different community talk about their progress. We had uh, something like 40 talks. And uh, recently, they have wrote, wrote a lot of review papers um, discuss their recent progress. So th this is a very, uh, very, very active uh, field that we have. Uh, talk a little bit about the recent development of MHD reconnection and the kinetic sim uh, simulations. You know, earlier there had been this long-standing problem about how you can produce fast reconnection. And uh, um, the development over the past two decades, roughly, you know, they found that really in an MHD regime, you actually can produce fast reconnection where the plasmoid dominated the reconnection model. There has been analytical work that showing um, this uh, time instability can actually grow very fast. And uh, um, so the reconnect, even you, with, you start with the sweet Parker reconnection, the reconnection become fractal and filled with plasmoid. And uh, the associated numerical simulations actually find that if you measure the reconnection rate, there seems to be a threshold and a, uh, for the Lundquist number, uh, that's roughly the ratio um, of uh, the system set times the R speed divided by resistivity. So if this number is larger than uh, around the 10,000, the reconnection rate actually seems to be stable, roughly something like 1%. Um, at the same time, you know, we also have kinetic simulations showing more or less the same picture. You know, this uh, this simulation you you can see it generate multiple um, uh, plasmoids, and the reconnection rate is also very fast. Um, it looks a few times larger than the MHD reconnection, um, which means we don't fully understand the. Uh, 
on the difference between MHD and the kinetic reconnection. But overall, you know, it is a lot more, you know, relieving that we can actually generate a fast reconnection uh, rather than, you know, basically this reconnection um, process actually can explain the fast energy release in both space and astrophysics. Um, and uh, when our simulation become better, we actually can do three-dimensional reconnection. And we, it, it looks like there are two, the, when, when we do the 3D reconnection, one thing we obviously will notice is that the reconnection layer become turbulent. And whether that will influence reconnection physics is also active topic to be discussed. But what we say, there seem to be at least two instabilities that are responsible for the production of um, turbulence. On the top, this is from Bill Dalton's uh, 2011 Nature Physics paper showing the oblique tearing. You can see the upper layer generates, uh, um, the separatives generate a series of plasmoids, but in 3D, and also you can find the other plasmoids in, in the other separatives. They actually have oblique oriented uh, flux ropes when you have a finite gas field. Uh, and we recently found that if the gas field is weaker, which is actually a case, we think the particle acceleration is even more promising. The, the reconnection layer showing in the bottom left, you can see multiple um, um, small scale flux ropes. But those flux ropes also are unstable to the kink instability. This is a flux rope that is become kink un unstable. Their safety factor is um, become um, smaller than one or larger than one. <laughs> uh, and we recently have more dedicated uh, simulation to, for example, in um, changing the size of the simulation in the third dimension of the reconnection layer, uh, reconnection plan. We actually find that you can you can really um, find the threshold when this uh, kink instability, flat of kink instability become unstable, showing on the right. And in this case, uh, I will show later, it actually have implications for particle acceleration, but also generate the turbulence in three-dimensional reconnection. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I will focus more on the particle acceleration. And this is, of course, depend on the development of uh, reconnection models, as I talked about. So in the beginning of the reconnection study, uh, it's more the, the picture is more dominated by single X point reconnection, where you won't have too much reconnection, uh, you won't have too much particle mm -hmm. acceleration happening because uh, most uh, acceleration happen at the X point where it's, this region is uh, kinetic and localized. So it was initial, uh, initially thought this is not a very promising acceleration. Uh, for example, if you want to explain very large scale uh, a lot of um, energetic particle production. Um, but, but later, the, as I mentioned, the, the picture has been evolved into a more plasmoids or multi X point uh, reconnection, and where the, a lot of acceleration can happen. You know, you can have X point, multi -po X point acceleration, and also Fermi and beta tron acceleration. And of course, there can be waves and turbulence, especially when we are more evolved into three-dimensional reconnection. Um, and we observe the generation of turbulence that could influence both acceleration, but also the transport of the energetic particles in, in the reconnection layer. So we are, of course, interested in those acceleration mechanisms, but also uh, we want to ask what's the resulting distribution function, and especially I mentioned a lot of the 
uh, observations indicate the non-thermal spectrum, especially um, power law distribution in energy. Um, but earlier simulations, um, this this for now this is something like uh, earlier than ten years ago. Those simulation was not able to produce clear power law distribution. Um, but what what we find now is actually um, the development uh, over the, this decade. Uh, that we have found that we can routinely produce this non-thermal power law distribution, either when the, this sigma, which is roughly the ratio between the magnetic energy and the, the rest energy of the plasma, it's roughly larger than one, or the plasma beta in the non-relativistic case is smaller than roughly 10%. It seems like this uh, uh, non-thermal distribution can be fairly robustly produced um, but what's the details about how the power law is formed and uh, uh, um, how do you build a, um, a theory from that? It, it is still an uh, active uh, field to, uh, of research. And also we are interested in the role of turbulence and also the, the way to build a large scale theory as we have solar flares and uh, astrophysical reconnection that can uh, is over a scale much much larger than the kinetic scale. Um, so hopefully most of the people are familiar with the peak simulation, but this is essentially a combination of Newtonian description of energetic particle uh, motion using their equation of motions and also the Maxwell equations. So the code will solve this two set of equations self-consistently. Of course, this is uh, um, mostly in the starting from the kinetic scale and try to go larger and larger scales. Uh, but we, we would like to, the past uh, you know, decade, is try to use this method to learn um, the physics of particle acceleration and also try to infer the mechanisms for large scales. So I'm mostly going to discuss two set of um, simulations, the relativistic reconnection, the sigma parameter is much larger than one. And for the non-relativistic simulation, you can compare the roughly the energy of the magnetic field uh, um, to the thermal energy flux of the particles. If this number is very large, that also indicates uh, a, a promising particle acceleration can happen. And we start from this uh, so-called false freak Paris current sheet, where the um, magnetic field is rotating uh, uh, along, uh, you know, across the current sheet to produce the reversal and also the, the current density. And uh, most the simulation I'm going to show today is uh, in the x direction. The bulk is periodic, and in the z direction, it's conducting. Um, but there have been um, open boundary simulations in the community and sort of reached more or less the same conclusion. So this is actually a fairly old movie, but um, so Greg probably have a much better movie to show. But maybe that's just to illustrate the process is probably enough. Um, you know, when we start the simulation, there we have a, perturbation that makes the extended uh, um, and thin current sheet. And this current sheet is unstable to the secondary terrain instability. And you generate a lot of the uh, um, plasmoids. And those plasmoids uh, can interact with each other, merge with each other, each other uh, and, until <laughs> it's only one, uh, there won't be much left in the simulation. Um, Simulation can be more complicated in 3D. As we can see, uh, th this again shows the current density. And this is the largest, largest uh, three-dimensional simulations we have done. And we also add the uh, initial uh, fluctuation in 3D <laughs> to perturb the system and drive additional turbulence. We show this. So initially, we drive at the additional um, perturbation, but also there is a um, 
two D like perturbation that creates this X line in the middle, but it did it become very broad a three dimensional layer where in when you generate this uh, flat roof, they can be um unstable to the uh, flat roof kink instability. So you can see they're distorted that they are actually very dynamical. The um let me play this again. So if you look at some of the regions, the 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 king in the is so severe you can have some flat roofs um got disrupted and completely you know disappear in the simulation domain. So this is a you know very turbulent, very dynamical reconnection layer and we are trying to understand. Is, is there a guide field in this simulation? This simulation, uh, no. Yeah. Uh, we, in the associated paper, we actually have a mm -hmm. get a field case, but that's basically uh, seem to agree with the oblique tearing mm -hmm. picture, more or less. You know, it's this uh, big surprise 10 years ago, at least, that uh, several different groups, including the Grado and also Princeton or Columbia group and also Los Alamos, roughly at the same time doing the seamless, more or less the same simulation I just mentioned. And uh, it seems like when the sigma parameter is very large, very robustly generates this non-thermal power law distribution. So this figure shows energy spectrum at a different time. Initially, it's a more or less a thermal distribution. And the, um, uh, very soon, this is within some kind of you know, roughly uh, that crossing time scale, it generates this very clear non-thermal power law spectrum. Um, so everybody got very excited about this. Um, but then there's also debate on the primary acceleration mechanism and uh, the resulting energy spectrum. And how do you understand this spectrum? Especially, um, I mentioned that in the non-relativistic reconnection study, they have been trying quite a for maybe at least a decade or so to produce this non-thermal spectrum, but um, they couldn't. And the, the common assumed uh, reason is that a periodic simulation cannot produce a power law because there is no appropriate escape mechanism. Um, but clearly, they have a different, uh, you know, picture now because our the same simulation as long as you have uh, enough energy supply, it it does generate non thermal spectrum. Um, so this picture actually let's start with uh, uh, the acceleration mechanism. So we we trace energetic particle trajectory to understand their Energization. So this movie I'm gonna show the color on the upper panel shows the outflow um outflow speed in the x direction, in the horizontal direction, and there are two sub panels showing the energy as a function of time and also energy as a function of x direction. So we have one sample particles we trace and sort of the it go into the reconnection layer and got bumped a few times by the uh, outflows. And uh, in each bounce, you can the, roughly, the acceleration is roughly comparable to its own energy. So this is more or less a, uh, a picture of a Fermi acceleration. Uh, there is an initial phase. I'm going to talk later about the injection. But the, for most of the energization uh, for our particle tracing, uh, result is seems to be generated by this uh, Fermi acceleration mechanism. Um, and uh, but that's only one particle. So what we wanted to do was to um, ensemble average a lot of particles and try to collectively understand their acceleration mechanism. So the Sort of the simplest thing I would I did and uh, admittedly probably won't be able to distangle all the acceleration mechanism, but this is what we did at least uh, um, so far was using the guiding center approximation to separate 
um, different motions. And what you can do is, um, for example, the Fermi and beta trunk acceleration, they are correspond to the curvature of grand B drift. Uh, those drift motions are transferred to the magnetic field. So they have to take advantage of this uh, perpendicular electric field or motional electric field that's usually the U cross B electric field in the Ohm's law. But there can be acceleration along the um, along the magnetic field or in a very big magnetic field, it can be a non-ideal, uh, uh, sorry, in a, you know, uh, uh, better um, like trajectories. So currently we have, a, you know, if it's along the magnetic field, of course it's just parallel, but the feather can be perpendicular to the magnetic field. That's, I think that's a little bit tricky to separate and Dimitri has a paper, um, mostly analytical based on that. <laughs> I think that part, maybe if we have time, we can discuss how to disentangle that. Um, but if you think about the parallel electric field, that's mainly the using the non-ideal electric field. That's if you look at the Ohm's law, that's rest of the terms other than this U cross B electric field. And you can also look at their drift motions, as I mentioned, uh, um, the the Fermi and the um, beta trunk acceleration they correspond bound to the, the guiding center drift um, uh, in in this in this approximation. So we can figure out there essentially there the current they generate and uh, the energization they have um, in in this uh, drift motions. And overall, the takeaway is that we look at these uh, um, different drift terms and uh, ensemble a large number of trajectories. So the world we find is that it seems like the dominant acceleration term is from this curvature drift acceleration um, that corresponds to a particle um, go around the island and get a Fermi acceleration. It's actually a nice drawing in Fermi's original 1949 paper on this, I believe. Um, and also there has been what we did initially was a relativistic reconnection case, but there has been community like Joe Daly and Xiao Tani have done a non-relativistic study uh, seem to show the same picture. Um, and this is what the ensemble results we did by looking at, uh, at a lot of particles. So we can sort of average their particle motion and uh, look at the acceleration gain, uh, energy gain on the left. This is uh, a snapshot of the energy gain during uh, a particular time in the simulation. So the vertical axis is the energy gain during this period and the X axis is the particle energy. So you can see that um, the total energy is black and that is correspond to is agreed more or less with the curvature drift acceleration. Uh, and uh, the parallel electric field uh, is more or less the same, um, does not depend on energy very much. They're more important in a low energy, but at higher energy because they're, um, if you work out their acceleration, the scaling on the energy is weaker than the Fermi process. So at higher energy, they, they are, they sort of um, being dominated by Fermi acceleration. And from this, you can actually interestingly generate something uh, like mm -hmm. acceleration rate in Fermi's original paper, that sort of energy gain um, uh, divided by energy as a function of time. So that was represented by this alpha parameter. So we can see, you know, initially it's very vague. Uh, and during the acceleration, uh, to, sorry, during reconnection, it can be a period that you can uh, have a very strong acceleration and eventually death away um, um, later in time. And uh, okay. that also corresponds to this uh, uh, acceleration rate we got from the 
um, by measuring particle drift motion. And also we have an analytical sort of very simple model in the beginning to sort of represent the Fermi acceleration. It's also seem to agree with the uh, simulation results, uh, more or less. Um, and uh, what we did in the beginning, we actually have a much better model now, but maybe bear with me about the basic picture. So on the upper left, we sort of the idea that we think maybe uh, how the power law is formed. So in the background, you actually can have a cold plasma getting to the reconnection layer. Uh, you can get a Fermi acceleration or other, basically other, any kind of acceleration can happen. But here, when we derive, we use a Fermi acceleration. Uh, and uh, in our simulation, we don't have an escape, but we can add an escape when we have more realistic case. So we basically solve this uh, energy continuity equation with the injection and the escape term. And we assume the, there is a, the acceleration is mainly a Fermi acceleration with this acceleration correspond to alpha E, where alpha is the acceleration rate. Um, it is a constant, you can see it's thinking of a constant. And it, this is from, you know, even from Fermi's original paper, the you can get a power law distribution that depends on the acceleration and escape term. So we actually solve this equation analytically and what we find several conclusions. Uh, one is that as long as the acceleration is strong enough, you can get a power law distribution. It does not matter if you have this escape term or not. So the escape term does not determine if you have a power law distribution or not. Mm -hmm. So as, uh, on the upper right, it shows a few different solutions. <coughs> as long as this alpha, the acceleration, times the tau, the, basically the duration of the acceleration and injection, as long as this parameter is large enough, you know, you always generate a power law distribution. And uh, um, the rule of escape is more determining the slope of the power law rather than the formation of the power law. Um, but when you don't have any acceleration, uh, sorry, you, if you don't have any escape and when you have strong acceleration, this tends to give you a roughly a minus one spectrum, which is roughly the case when we get to very, very, very high sigma that seem to be the limit of this uh, uh, simulation results. Uh, and this is actually an updated uh, mm -hmm. figure, uh, a paper we did last year. And here it's more or less the same equation, but we include the, uh, the second order acceleration term that seems to also be important. And also a escape term, we find actually um, um, when they have this uh, plasmoids, the particle can actually go trapped in this uh, plasmoid, especially this plasmoid at the boundary. So to match with some simulations, especially proton electron simulations, they don't uh, always uh, converge to minus one spectrum it's important to have this term to explain the peak simulation results. And uh, we use a trajectory, we use actual mean trajectories to systematically figure out those um, um, acceleration coefficients and uh, escape, actually similar to um, Vladimir and uh, Wong's mm -hmm. paper to, to derive those uh, coefficients. The, the resulting spectrum we got is very similar to the peak simulation results. So we we actually are very happy about the agreement we have seen so far. Um, so maybe we can spend another 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so the rest is more on the non-relativistic reconnection, especially um, I mentioned earlier simulation, they have difficulty to generate non-thermal spectrum. And this is where actually the three-dimensional simulation is very important. Um, so this, but this is just an example. We show that 
we have low beta simulation where the reconnection um, can generate a lot of energetic particles, but the result does not um, give you a very sustainable non-thermal spectrum. So on the top is the energy, uh, the particle density. So the bottom left is uh, um, the energy of different um, part, the magnetic energy, that is um, uh, the, the change of the magnetic energy that is going negative, that is converted to the air and electron uh, energy. And on the right, this is the energy spectrum distribution. So when we run the simulation, we actually find a lot of energetic particles being produced. And there is a place, there is a time you can probably argue, oh, you, we may generate a non-thermal power law. But that power law gradually um, being curved uh, and seems suggest high energy particles have trouble to get more efficient acceleration. Uh, and what we find is that a lot of particles are trapped in those uh, big islands. Um, but when you have a three-dimensional simulation, uh, when this uh, flutter of king instability triggered, um, as, as this uh, safety factor is smaller than one, we actually, we actually find that this case, uh, you, you know, we can generate a more sustainable uh, power law distribution. Uh, so this, this result we published uh, three years ago was the first one that can generate both electron and proton non-thermal spectrum in a uh, non-relativistic case. And we also recently have a paper that uh, discusses uh, multi-ion um, species acceleration. They can also generate a non-thermal spectrum. Um, when, when in, in this uh, three-dimensional simulations. So the reason we think, you know, the, this the three-dimensional simulation can generate more energetic particles is because in two-dimensional simulations, you know, particles are stuck in the islands um, as, the, as their motions are restricted in their original field lines. But, and, but those regions, uh, when the islands are large enough, those are not the best place to accelerate particles. As we show in the bottom, this is showing the V dot kappa, the fluid velocity times the, um, the curvature of the main field. That's the main term representing the, the Fermi acceleration or curvature drift acceleration. Um, but in three-dimensional simulations, those particles can leak from the uh, the island and getting to this uh, more like exhaust region where this V dot cover term is the strongest. So that seems to uh, give uh, have the chance that particle can transport between different uh, islands and uh, lead to more uh, acceleration. Uh, to show this, you know, we, we did some test particle simulation using one snapshot. And we only inject particles in a very small region. And uh, very quickly, those particles will spread uh, across most of the uh, reconnection region. So that's indicated the efficiency um, that the particle transport within, within three-dimensional turbulent reconnection region can be very efficient. Uh, the one of the things we notice, if you look at this uh, reconnection uh, acceleration rate uh, in the Fermi original paper, it is supposed to be a constant as a function of energy. So this top figure, actually, if you look at the orange line that shows the 2D results that has the, you know, the high energy particle won't get accelerated. Uh, and also this uh, curve is not energy independent. But for the 3D result, the acceleration rate is more or less energy independent. And we also, in the bottom, we also did the getting center um, approach. And uh, the curvature shift is still the most uh, efficient acceleration in three-dimensional uh, reconnection. 
फॉलो करते हो फिर सो द लास्ट टॉपिक इज आई थिंक इट्स ओनली स्टार्टेड टू डिस्कस मोर रिसेंटली यू नो आफ्टर अ लॉट ऑफ पेपर्स डिस्कसिंग द पावर लॉ बट व्हाट्स द um if if the all the acceleration is due to this uh, fermi acceleration in high energy there is usually associated injection mechanism to boost a lot of energy from their thermal path path to the to the um the beginning of the power law distribution so um this paper um from Lorenzo Cerrone I create they show there is actually a, Strong <laughs> correlation between the particles got injected into the parallel distribution and uh, the particle that goes through the region with z larger than b, which is usually correspond to the x point in the reconnection layer. Um, and 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 they also show you know different analysis. Um, but what what we find is that the, those particles probably don't have enough time. And and only in the uh, x point region to get efficient acceleration, because usually those particles need to gain a, roughly a fraction of um, the Lorentz factor need to be a fraction of the sigma at least to be accelerated. And actually, you can use the reconnection rate to figure out their um, the time you need to get accelerated, uh, uh, and uh, there is a few. Um, sort of mistakes I think Lorenzo had in his analysis. But the, to illustrate what I'm thinking is that um, for each particle, I can track their acceleration within the E larger than B region. And I can actually uh, track how much energy they gain from those regions. So these uh, two curves, um, you know, determined by how what what do you believe with injection energy? So I did both uh, like a quarter sigma versus sigma. And then you can look at how much time individual particles spend time before they get accelerated in those energy. So you can plot the distribution of of that actually this is the sort of the, the, the horizontal axis should be the energy. So gamma. So and this vertical line is the time you actually need to achieve um, the injection. Basically, the injection, uh, the energy of the particle need to be a fraction of the sigma. So what I find is very, very few of the uh, <laughs> particles will have sufficient time to reach the injection just singly um, by the um, by the e larger than b regions. And we are also writing a few papers to clarify this more. Um, that's sort of the last topic I want to. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the so Omar had uh, um, this. Uh, I think uh, maybe the best paper on this, looking to different acceleration mechanism, and this is also a paper um, we discussed uh, broadly <laughs> with Dimitri. That you actually can have several different mechanisms they can operate, and they sort of can be more important in different. Each one can be more important or dominant in each parameter regime. So the first one is the typical x point acceleration, and the second one is Fermi acceleration, but in low energy, it's sort of more like one kick because of the other flow, and so seven <laughs> not. Discussed a lot by um, relativistic reconnection community, but the particle can basically become <clears throat> magnetized uh, and somehow get into the reconnection layer. And uh, it's more like a pickup process when the particle is demagnetized and um, <laughs> become magnetized again in the in the outflow and uh, gain energy. So um, this figure is complicated, but more or less when we reach large simulation domain, we actually find that this is for different gas field, the Fermi and the pickup, um, uh, pickup process is more important 
for low gas fuel, and when you get to strong gas fuel regime, the the direct acceleration is more important. Uh, so I probably skip this one. And also, you you can this also a bad product of this is you can figure out sort of the energy partition between non thermal and uh, thermal um acceleration, and therefore you can derive <laughs> a efficiency <laughs> of injection. Uh, on the left, it shows the number in, um in efficiency. On the right, it's showing the energy efficiency. It actually shows the low gas field is probably in the most promising place to accelerate the particles because they have very high efficiency for non-thermal particles. And also this, for that case, you can have even up to 80 or 90% of uh, particles, um, of, you know, the energy, the released energy is roughly 80 or 90% contained by the non-thermal particles. Uh, I probably will skip the last topic. I think I think we can have more time to to discuss. That's uh, basically for the large scale uh, acceleration pro um, process. So um, mostly, I think we understand a lot more about non thermal particle acceleration, but there are still issues we need to resolve. Uh, the dominant acceleration. The analysis we did uh, mostly the low gas field regime due to the Fermi acceleration. And that actually seemed to be more promising than the gas field acceleration in terms of both the maximum energy and the efficiency of the acceleration. Um, and those acceleration, if you, the slide, the slide that you skipped, uh, skipped uh, more like how do you, um, for large scale um, acceleration, maybe you can use either guiding center approximation or some kind of transport equation to solve the large scale acceleration. Um, but, you know, I'm happy that we probably have a less discussion this afternoon that we can resolve some of the uh, issues more and uh, maybe we, can collaborate more uh, in the future. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you.